Excellent stuff. Hello, and with me today, I have Linda Bloodworth. Linda is the author of the Raven Trilogy, um, which begins with, um, is it Raven's Touch? It begins with Linda. That's right. Yeah, uh, Raven's Touch and Raven's Revenge are already out there. Uh, what's the title of the third one? Raven's Resurrection. When can we expect that? That's a good question. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I'm hoping to finish the fi the first draft this year, and then honestly, it takes me it takes me about a year to go through the fi like the final revisions of everything because I have to go through a beta read, I have to go through editing, and then that in itself is a minor form of purgatory. Um, and then uh, <laughs> that that literally will take a year because then I have to hum and haw over every comma and whether or not I'm going to try to stay true to myself or am I going to offend someone or something that, uh, you know, I struggle with, I think, with most writers do. But in the end, I just do what I want to do. Um, but it'll at least, at least take me a year to finally finish the first draft and then another year to finish the uh, polishing off. Um, right, I've gone so far ahead of myself there. So um, for the audience, please, um, which genre do you write in and how do you define that genre? You know what, that's an excellent question because I am not one genre. I am upper young adult with new adults, with paranormal, with horror, with um, like a supernatural, it, it's with action and a minor bit of gore. Very minor, but also, um, and all that wrapped with the religious, with religious, religious themes. Um, that's incredibly interesting. So, um, away from religion for a moment, but um, on the whole idea that you're up a young adult with paranormal and with, um, I think there was some sexual activity in Raven's Revenge. Um, that's right. I know that you put lots of trigger warnings on there so that nobody um, is surprised or upset or offended by the content of your writing. Um, does this hit you hard with Amazon algorithms? Do you find that Amazon algorithms are sort of like pushing you away as in, oh no, look at something here where they've not been so honest? Mm, I don't know. I haven't seemed to notice. My rankings are pretty decent um, for and I mean decent in quotations, okay? So decent for an indie author who has a full-time job. Um, I, I don't think it hurts me in any way um, because frankly, it's the ratings that will hurt you. And I would rather have someone be understanding of what they're getting into versus being the cause of someone's nightmare or the cause of someone's discomfort. Um, you've got a lot more faith in readers than I have because um, because I don't trust people to read trigger warnings. Um, if oh, no, I tell them straight up, this might scare you. This might freak you out. This might not be your cup of tea. Um, that's, uh, yeah, that's a very, very honest approach. Um, I always worry with mine that if I say to people, this might scare you, that they're going to come back and say, that didn't scare me in the slightest. I've, yeah, I've read that and I just laughed in a couple of places. Um, maybe I'm writing in the wrong genre. Um, Linda, what's your writing schedule? Oh my gosh. Um, it's, it's kind of a sporadic thing. Like I said, like full-time job, it's, it's hard. Like in all honesty, I know this sounds crazy, but I did a lot of writing on the subway on my phone on Google docs. If you can imagine that I, I, um, literally anytime I've got a spare moment, if I'm in a matter of waiting for something, I'm on my phone writing. If I have a blessed two hours in my day, I'm trying to get into the chair and, and, and write. So it's a very sporadic, I don't have like a set schedule of any sort. I wish I did. Um, my schedule doesn't allow for that right now. Um, but I do like that whole idea that you're writing whenever the opportunity to write allows itself. That must mean that you're very, very passionate about writing. If I'm not doing it, I feel like I'm not breathing completely get that yeah it's like um yeah it's it's so stifling isn't it um so um yes uh, um, i do like the idea of subway writing as well um, do you know with me for traveling time um because i drive i use that time for reading i will stick an audio book on and uh yeah i've got um an hour long commute one day of the week and and it's just delightful i can get through an entire short story or 
half a novel. Yeah, it's brilliant that. Um, so, which is most important to you? Is it plot or character? You know what, in all honesty, it's the character because you could put the character in any situation and either they will either rise to the occasion or not. Um, I mean, it's that character that people connect with. So whatever is happening to them is, it's not inconsequential, but it's a matter of somebody realizing, hey, that's a little bit of me in there. Or I totally understand the pain that that person's going through or the joy or whatever the emotion is. It's, I, I really do feel like it's all about the character because that character can make or break the story and people can laugh, cry, really um, get their emotions wrapped up in what that character is all about. Yeah, I think, I think I know exactly what you're saying there. Um, so how does that work for when you're um, preparing a story? Um, in your idea, have you just got the idea that the character is going to follow this particular journey? Or do you just leave the character to take you on that journey? Oh, they completely just do what they want. Um, there's, no, <laughs> there's no me going like, oh, we're going to do this now. <laughs> it, it's more along the lines of, oh, well... I guess this is happening. Like, it, it, writing is such a weird thing. I mean, you're you're basically hallucinating and writing it down. And I find that it's very much like a trance. Um, I don't even know what I'm doing half the time until after it's done and the devil has danced with me and I realize at the end something has been produced. Because when I look back and I read ad, read everything, I'm like, did I really write this? Like, it's honestly, I'm even shocked half the time of some of the things that I've done. Um, that's a good place to be though, really. Um, so yeah, uh, my fourth question is, what piece of writing advice would you give to anybody who's just starting out? Oh my gosh, read everything, please. Please read everything. And I mean, everything you can get your hands on, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, someone has put the effort in, someone has created something that you should probably try to, you know, let that sink in. Um, and try to find your own voice because I find that a lot of times people are saying to you, oh, you know, this, this topic is hot and you'll make so much money if you write about this or whatever, but that really doesn't matter um, because if you're not happy with what you produce, like, I guess you could live like that, but I mean, that's just not something that I would really recommend. Just try to find the voice that you sound like. And if you have to try to um, maybe get a few exercises and get uh, to get what that sounds like out, you know, do it, right? Like do a bright bunch of writing prompts, try to see where the story takes you and try to see what you sound like versus oh, you're just going to write another Stephen King emulation story or Clive Barker or something like that. They have their own voices. So find yours. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's one of the things that people don't appreciate often enough. They look back over a draft that they've produced and think, well, it's nothing like a Stephen King or it's nothing like a Clive Barker, therefore it's not very good. And people fail to realise that their own voices... Um, a distinctive and yeah we each as an individual we can bring so much more um who do you read for pleasure oh my gosh um i am very guilty of the stephen king club yeah. um, i'm not gonna lie um but lately i've been reading um more of my fellow indie friends and uh i i'm just really impressed with the talent um there's a, a new well, new to me author that I've made friends with, and I'm pleased to say, uh, his name is Steve Stred. Oh yeah, yeah Mastered Up, yes. Yeah, and I, I have that on my Kindle. I mean, I'm, I'm reading it, and I'm 37% into it, and uh, it's fantastic, um, super impressed. And my friend, um, they're both oddly Canadian, uh, Kate DeJong, and she has a bunch of short stories on Godless, Honestly, her Helen story, I couldn't have felt more creepier. And reading it was like, this woman has just kind of lost her mind, lost her reference and her family. And it's just, she's losing track of time. And 
it was just like standing in a room with television static blaring. Wow. So it just felt uncomfortable and weird. And you know something is happening, but you just can't turn that TV off. Like it that's how I describe the story. It's it's tingly and weird, but I loved it. Is that what you enjoy from reading, the physicality of the response that you can get from a text? Um, I guess. I never thought of it in that way. Um, I just find that I want to read stories that will surprise me, that will engage me, that, you know, if they scare me, great. Um, I think I've built up quite a tolerance in terms of what scares me, perhaps. So if you can <laughs> creep me out, that's great. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's so difficult, isn't it? We sort of, as you say, we build up a tolerance. Uh, we're almost in building up an immunity to it. So when something does um, surprise us, because it's so difficult to do a jump scare in writing, the way a good slasher film will just sort of like scare me just because there's a loud noise and something lurches at the screen. Um, but we don't get that. Um, so you're the author of series fiction, Raven's Touch, Raven's Revenge. Um, do you think the creation of series fiction takes a different mindset to the creation of standalone pieces? Hmm. You know, it's a good question. Um, because I find that with a standalone, you you I feel like you can be a little bolder with the, the characters because it's just, you know, just gonna be an end piece and that's it. But with a uh, a series, you kind of have to cradle these characters because they're unless you can kill them off, right? Um, but you want to make sure that they're going to survive all three books or or the series of what have you. I mean, you know, you could be George R. R. Martin and, you know, kill everybody. But it it's just, it's a different, yeah, it is a different mindset because you really have to be mindful of how the development is and the story arcs and the side arcs. And there's, there's a lot more complications when it comes to a series. And you've got a standalone. It's just like, go out there and have some fun. Um, so do you think with a series, um, once somebody's read A Raven's Touch, do you think they're expecting something similar in structure in A Raven's Revenge and in Raven's Resurrection? Or do you think they're going to be sort of like blindsided by the things that you've got happening? You know I'm what, it's funny. Um, I've had people tell me that the first book, A Raven's Touch, where they think it's all hunky-dory in the first half of the book and then the second half just like the curtain drops and the fangs come out and weird stuff is happening so they were just like is this two different books that you just mashed together and I was like <laughs> hey, you have not been paying attention <laughs> so no um yeah I, I do think people kind of get the idea that something wicked this way comes um because the ending is is really poignant of the first book and it's very obvious something bad is happening and you don't even realize how bad that is until you get into the second book and then you're like oh man this was way worse than I anticipated <laughs> um the third book is just going to be a bloodbath so it's uh I mean it, it, the title implies resurrection so a few may fall and then we'll see what happens in the end you're having a lot of fun with this series aren't you it's, you know what, it's, it's funny because this is my promise to my 14 year old self. So I first wrote or even such when, from the ages of 14 to 18 over the summer. And that was my summer project as a teenager. So I was very invested in writing this. It took me like, I, I'm from Canada and I'm old. So I had five years of high school. I had OAC, which was uh, year 13. So for five years, I wrote in the summer, this, this book. Um, just sporadically, because, you know, teenagers, right? Um, then I finally got it and finished it. I even have my diary entry from when I finished writing this book um, in 1996, don't tell anyone. And <laughs> when I was uh, 35, I rewrote it as an adult and, and oh my gosh, I upgraded it and everything. But I, even my, my dedication is, my de this book is dedicated to my 14-year-old self. Like, we did it. And you'd be so proud, you'd be so happy, and you didn't give up on this dream. And you you just, I don't care if it doesn't sell. I mean, it does, but it, <laughs> the point is, I, I did it. Um, so yeah, it is a big passion of mine because this, this is a promise to myself. And a lot of times you find that you go through life, things happen, you get sidetracked. 
but it finally made sense in the end. Wow. Well, wow. I'm so glad we touched on that thread. I know that I've got some students who would be very interested to hear about the fact that you've kept a promise to your 14-year-old self because I know that they've made similar promises. And yeah, um, thank you for that. So yeah, um, right. You are genuinely one of the most savvy marketing writers that I know. Um, your idea for, um, it was a takeover that we did on um, your Facebook page, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, which was um, which was an awful lot of fun and just a great way of getting to know other writers. Um, do you think it's important for writers to engage with marketing? And what marketing advice would you give to a novice writer? Oh my gosh, it's like essential. Um, <laughs> let let me let me also have a little caveat that I actually have a marketing background and that is my day job. Right. So, um, so please don't think that this was some brainchild that I had. Um, I, and I've also relied on the community. Um, when I first started, you know, appearing on, on the scene, I, I was taken under the wing by some romance writers. These women are savvy to the nth degree. They are amazing. They taught me all about the takeovers and then the promos and the blitzes and everything that you do that's fun and, and inviting and interesting. So I do, I do give them credit. Um, because if from my traditional marketing background, I was like, oh, I'll do this, this, this. That did not work. So this was <laughs> from Booksmart and, you know, actual 20 years of marketing experience, mind you. Um, it's a different beast when it comes to the indie world. And I learned that rather quickly. Um, and, and like, I think young people, young people know, marketing is a big deal. Um, you need to sell your brand. You all have to be on brand. Do what makes sense for you, your writing, your style. It's essential. If you can't build an audience, I mean, that's a tough thing. It's not a, if you write it, they will come. That is not what's going to happen at all. You, you need to have a community. You need to be able to draw on your friends, um, other like-minded individuals, and, and make that group the center of, you know, your promotions. And everybody gets a little help from their friends, right? So, I mean, you know, to quote the Beatles, right? But you have a little bit of uh, someone who knows this or someone who knows that. And then all of a sudden you come together and you're this weird amalgamation of arms and legs and toes and freaky deaky. And there you go. Um, you mentioned using the community. Um, and I, I know you don't mean using and abusing the community, um, but um, yeah, the writing community um, is, I mean, each writing community I've been in seems to be quite supportive and helpful for all the other people um, who are out there. Is that your, has that been your experience? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I've come across so many wonderful people who have sat down and explained things to me and just taken time to just really make sure I understood the process and have helped me and introduced me to so many other people. And I was like, thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much. Like, you know, is there something I can do for you? And they're like, no, no, just, just welcome. And I was like, oh my gosh, I was like so touched. It's, it's really a beautiful thing. Um, yeah. Do you think that's because as writers, we're, we're relatively solitary in what we're doing and producing. Um, so it's just nice to be able to actually help people who share our passion. I would like to think that there are altruistic, yeah, behaviors behind this. Um, I think people are super nice in general because they see, oh, I was at that point, you know, let me give back in that way. I, I truly do believe the community is a fantastic place of um, a cesspool of nice. <laughs> a cesspool of nice, yeah. Um, <laughs> we should have that as a Facebook page, shouldn't we? Um, <laughs> Right. In our brief discussion then, before this interview, we talked about anonymity. Um, so do you think anonymity affords you fewer restrictions on your creativity? Um, or conversely, do you think it would be limiting? Um, because obviously anybody who's watching this video at the moment will be able to see um, that um, you've got an icon there because um, you're conscious of um, yeah, distancing yourself, you're compartmentalizing yourself from your marketing side and your writer persona. Is that correct? Oh, absolutely. Um, is there freedom in it? Um, well, yes and no, because there's freedom from the daily life 
of you know who you are for sure but you still are someone online like if i said oh you know I don't know, whatever horrible thing I could think of, so then all of a sudden there's still cancel culture. There's still someone yeah. who could come after you. There's still someone who could tear down your persona. Um, you weren't free from that. You're on the internet. Um, but having the separation completely helps because there have been situations that I've personally experienced where I am glad that I had a persona. Um, it's just some negative interactions yeah. and then I've just had to be like oh thank goodness I have this separation um and then sometimes it kind of bothers me because then I'm like oh I really really am fond of this person I wish I could tell them um so it's a double-edged sword um yeah I completely get that for a while I wrote under a female pseudonym and it was just it was awful going to bookshops and stuff like see my books on the shelves in there and not be able to nudge people and go you know that's me there because they would have just sort of like say you're a bloke you that's um, that's not your name up there um so yeah i completely get that um yeah um again on the subject of anonymity and it's a question that one of my students um raised um and it possibly applies with um, what you have in Raven's Revenge. Um, do you think it's awkward to write sex scenes when people know who you are? Oh, oh my gosh. This is the reason my mother does not know about this name. Um, yes. <laughs> yes, it yeah. is. It's so weird. Also that my husband reads all of my work first. He's the first one to read the final drafts. Um, so I, just, I still feel awkward about it. It's, mm. it's like, uh, my characters are also like 18, right? So I am not that age. Uh, so it's awkward in me. I feel like this dirty old lady sometimes, but perhaps that's just my mental space in it. Um, I try to make it less brutal on myself and just get it over with um but it's funny because i get comments about it and they're like oh that was salacious what else can you do and i'm like nothing 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 else is gonna come up from this um, it was just a hot and heavy moment and that's it um but it's uh yeah personally i i, I do feel awkward about it suppose that's um, one of the things though isn't it um, with anything if we feel as though there's an emotional connection or something that's going to upset or potentially offend somebody who's um, who we know then we don't really want to expose them to that so yeah I completely get that and yeah I can understand why why I've got a student worrying about that um, yeah final question so um, what are you currently working on and where can we find out more about you and your work? Um, yeah, so Raven's Resurrection, I've got about 30,000 words. Um, I plan to make this at least 80 to 90. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm trying to be as concise as I can because editing is expensive. The first book was 120,000 words and it was actually more, it was like a lot more. And that was what it was cut down to. And um, that cost a pretty penny. And it's not that I'm trying to write to save myself, but I've also learned to not overwrite. And that was a big problem um, The first with the first book. And the second book is considerably smaller, around 80,000. And so with the third one, I need to get the story out there and, and it is what it is, but I'm, I'm hoping to aim it around, uh, around 80,000 or so. Um, and yeah, it's interesting you say get the story out there. It takes us back to marketing. And um, I think that's one of the important things that people overlook. We write stories um, because we want people to enjoy them. But as you say, writing them isn't enough, is it? You need to market them so they actually get out into the hands of people who are going to read them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's half the battle right I mean you know here I've got a shiny pretty penny do you you know want to look at it <laughs> and then of course comes the uh the reviews where I have looked at some reviews and I thought oh you know what I wish I knew this person as a beta reader you know they bring up some valid points okay I've 
I can see where they thought that. And based on one review that was literally just flaming, I said, okay, I'm pulling my books and I'm re-editing them um, because this lady just tore me a new one. And I thought, all right, fine. Um, I have a tense problem with tenses and I know that. And I've had literally had the book edited eight times, I kid you not, the first book. Um, that's why I said it was expensive. And it's lengthy, so that didn't help either. But um, the review kind of just said, this was not good and this lady's doing this. So I was like, all right. So I took the good from it. The rest was just like, I don't know what's wrong with her, but the rest was just, mm, you know, mean. But, I suppose uh, the thing is, when we start reading something, though, if if we're reading something and we're unhappy with page one, in that case, we start looking for faults so that we can find a way of sort of like, yeah, dismissing it and being brutal and harsh against it. Um, and I think, yeah, that's probably human nature. But also, there's some like there's some mean reviewers out there. Um, I had one of my novels. Um, somebody um, with one of my novels. Somebody put a review on Amazon saying. Uh, you can tell this book was written by a woman because she takes a hundred pages to get to the start of the story. Oh wow! And I just thought, <laughs> um, <laughs> you as <laughs> yeah, there is no way I'm taking any of this criticism on board because you were quite wrong about the woman part, really. So yeah, anything else that you've got to say after that really doesn't count. <laughs> Interesting, but <laughs> you know, it it just it takes all kinds, right? So I mean, I tried to just take the best of what I could from what she said and and deal with it and then you know I got it re-edited I still want to get it edited again um because like I said it's 120,000 words things get missed and it's you even find things in in traditionally published books that that are considered errors all the time absolutely yeah um Linda it has been an absolute delight chatting with you thank you so much for taking the time out um yeah much appreciated. If you send me links, I will put them into the um, feed below so that people can see where to find your work. And thank you. Thank you.